all for today. Uh, I posted some information about the hands-on session. You have the, a link to the lectures here, if that helps. And then, um, so the hands-on session are Jupyter Notebooks. So you should, okay, you have two options. You have the option of running everything online with Binder, which is essentially just a cloud, uh, a cloud computing way of running your Jupyter Notebooks. So you can try this. Or you can simply copy the, the files from this GitHub repository and run locally your, uh, your Jupyter installation and run locally your, the Jupyter notebooks. Now, I'll let you decide which one you want to do. Binder is probably the easiest one because everything is online. The downside is that since everything is online, if you, if you make modification, they will not be saved on your workstation. So you will have to save them by hand on your workstation. And I put just uh, some instruction here on how to do this. You just have to download the files after the file after you've actually uh, downloaded it, after you've edited it. If you prefer not using binder or can't use binder, and you don't know how to run a Jupyter Notebook, you can actually follow instructions here. Um, if, that, if that doesn't work, please post, uh, post your question here. And perhaps you can go in the breakout room as well and get some technical help. I assume that at this point, most of you are comfortable with uh, Binder, either Binder just running it uh, online or with just running a Jupyter Notebook in general. Now, take a few, take a, a minute or two to see if you can get either of them running and we'll run a poll to see uh, if you have everything set up ready. So the thing you should do, and this time let me share a different screen. So if you go in the GitHub repository, you also have the link to the binder. So if you're on binder, it will take you to a um, to this website that will eventually become this. And then you will simply, um, yeah, and then you will simply go to exercise zero, open it, and wait there for a second. Or you can start playing with it if you want. Now, uh, is it possible to just poll people and ask if they've managed to get either binder to work or if not to, I mean, just say yes if you're, if you're somehow open exercise zero, the notebook, and it looks like you can run something from it. And just say no if you're having problems. Or if you need more time. Yes, or if you need more time. Yes, and again, the alternative is you just copy uh, the code on your local workstation and then just open your favorite, uh, you know, Jupyter notebook and then you just, um, you just open exercise zero and it should run locally. It doesn't require a lot of, I'm using relatively standard library, so it should run, I think, out of the box for most people. So let's see, how is the polling we looking? 26 yeses and four no's. All right. Um, which is which is most people have not answered yet. We have 111 people online and typically about half of them actually respond to the polls. Okay. Uh, we'll just wait for a few minutes. And again, just post um, your, your questions. If you have any trouble, um, just ask on Slack or uh, ask if you can go so Chuck is still in the breakout room, right? Yep. Okay, so if you need technical uh, help, uh, again, try Binder first. If, if nothing else works, I would suggest just try Binder because that at least you don't have installation problems.
We are at 50 yeses and one no, and the yeses are slowly ticking up. So okay. maybe if you're that one no, if you can ask a question on the Slack so we can try to figure out what the issue is and where yeah. to direct you. Yeah, don't hesitate. There are plenty of people to help, and most likely it's not a very uh, it's not a very significant issue, and you can get the help very quickly. So I'll wait another few seconds, and then we'll move on. So again, just um, just make sure that you open exercise zero. And presumably at this point, you know how to use Jupyter Notebook. So just shift enter to so load uh, load libraries. So the example. So let me say a few words about um, the examples today. So. All the examples I'll show are relatively simple. So I made the editorial decision to use a very simple emulator for all these exercises. The benefit is that um, this should run anywhere, very few libraries. The code is relatively simple. And um, so, you know, in you know, 100 line of code, you can have a simple Bayesian analysis, Bayesian parameter estimation. And um, in theory, you can also, we've done, we've done Bayesian parameter estimation with linear interpolator as well. So the, the emulator that I use is just a linear interpolation, which means that I'm cheating somewhat because an emulator should be a probability distribution, uh, but I'm essentially assuming that we don't have statistical uncertainty. So we don't need to worry about the emulator overfitting uh, the, essentially the model. Uh, here, we're doing closure tests uh, for all the exercises. So the emulator will always be a good representation of the model. We could really just have used the model itself for, the, for all the Bayesian analysis I'm showing. But I, I, I just used the linear interpolation just to show that in general, for most practical application, you will need to load the calculation from outside, from some other source, and then perform your Bayesian parameter estimation. And in this case, you will need some form of emulation for simplest possible applications, or if you just want to, you know, uh, start learning slowly about Bayesian parameter estimation, the linear interpolator will do will do fine. If you want to start more systematic comparison with data, you'll need to use most likely a Bayesian parameter emulator which I'll give, uh, which Derek Everett has a very nice example. And I'll give it as uh, assignment for today if people want to look into it. And way out tomorrow uh, will be showing also an example using a Bayesian parameter estimator, uh, Bayesian parameter emulator. So let me proceed, I assume. So how's the poll now? 56 yeses and zero noes. Very good. All right. So, all right. So we have some observable that depend on the parameter. You could put anything here. This is a simple model. It's just a quadratic. So here you have your model that depends on the parameter. Here you have essentially your prior, which is the range of parameter you're interested in. So you just, uh, you just run this. Now, again, I'll be doing closure tests here, which means that I'm not loading, I'm not comparing with experimental data. I'm just assuming that my data I can obtain directly from the model. And the benefit again of doing this, as I discussed, is that you know what result you should obtain for your Bayesian parameter estimation. You know, you choose some value, some truth for your parameter, and you define your data as just uh, the mean of your data, as just your model evaluate that this truth. Now, you also want to define some uncertainty because your data will always come with uncertainty. So typically in a closure test, you will pick an uncertainty that is of the order of what you would expect from actual measurement. So if it's V2 or mean PT, V2 you might take a few percent uncertainty or mean PT as well. If it's a, you know RAA or maybe some observable that has higher statistical uncertainty, you may want you know 10 percent uncertainty. So you can pick your favorite value here. So I suggest for now, just leave the, the default value and just run till the end. And then you'll, uh, you should take a few minutes to just vary, vary these different values and see the, the effect on the, um, on the Bayesian parameter estimation. 
So you can just run this. So you define your essentially your art, your fake data here. And you can plot, of course, what your observable looks like. So your observable is just a quadratic in this case. That depends on the parity. And if you want, you can comment out a line that will just show where, where is the true value um, that you picked. So that's the value that we picked. So that's what we should recover from our Bayesian part estimation. And you can also plot, um, if you comment out these lines here, you can also show essentially what is the value of the observable that you're using as data. And it's here. So you have this, this band that you're using as data. Now here is where I essentially define my emulator. So again, I'm not using directly my model for the compare for the Bayesian part estimation. I'm using I'm using an emulator. But I'm using a very simple emulator that's just an interpolation, a one interpolation. So if you were to perform this against you know a real model output, you will you would replace this by instead of actually just uh, you know, getting calculation and, and making an interpolator from your calculation, you would just load some data, some, some calculation from disk. So here we don't need to do it because we have a very simple model. So we define some emulator here, very simple emulator. Here you have your, I assume that I have a unit prior here. And this is the definition of the likelihood. This is the posterior, which is the prior times the likelihood. At least this is proportional to posterior, actually. And you need to define this. And then the last step is you want to plot what your posterior is for a range of different values of your parameter. And you obtain something like this. So the true value was this one that you picked. And of course, your posterior here is around the true value. This is very simple, very straightforward. If you want, you can take a few minutes to actually vary some, some parameters. So you can change the function here. You can change the range of parameters you're interested in. You can change the truth. So if you change the truth here, um, let's say 5.6, and you rerun the whole thing. Um, you obtain again a, um, you know, you are obtaining again a posterior centered around around the true value. Now you can, of course, vary your or what is essentially your experimental uncertainty that you put by hand. So if you had a large experimental uncertainty, you would have a lot of difficulty constraining your parameters. So let's say I have 50% uh, relative uncertainty, then your posterior becomes very broad, right? And here, because we're not, so here the experimental and the uh, theoretical uncertainty is very much the same. So um, you don't necessarily need to vary the, the theoretical uncertainty as well. Now, again, I'm using a very simple emulator. So, so theoretical uncertainty here could be from statistical uncertainty, could be from numerical uncertainty. Now, if you use a proper emulator, you will also have emulator uncertainty from the interpolation. So your uncertainty kind of balloons up when you're away from points of constraint from the design points. So I don't have this information here because I'm using a very simple emulator. You can change your, your prior here if you want to see what the effect is. So you could have a prior. So if you think that it's very unlikely that your, um, your value of X is large, uh, then you could have a prior like this. Um, and this would change significantly. Let's see. Okay, so you have to run this and run this again. This would change significantly your posterior because essentially you're saying, no, no I'm quite confident that my that my uh, my value is small actually. But so so this result becomes this combination of your prior and your posterior. Now you would only do this if you're if you were quite quite confident actually that um, that you know what value of um, what was the value of x right and you can also plot if you want you can plot your 
prior in your likelihood separately. Okay, so the legend is not working, but um, so um, right. So I'm not normal. Actually, the the issue is I'm not normalizing properly all my distributions. So some of them look very small. Actually, so one thing, uh, one solution is just to make this a log plot. So you have your um, Okay, I don't know why the label is not showing up, but um, this is the posterior. This is the likelihood, and this is the prior. So if you have just a flat prior, then you don't need to worry about this. So if you have a flat prior, then of course your likelihood and your posterior become the same. All right, so can I just poll to see if everybody uh, managed to run this exercise, if there's any question, and if people manage to play, play with it and make sense of it? So I think this one may take them a little longer, but as I say that, the yeses are ticking up. Okay. Can you be a little, you said, play with it, but you, you would like them to run the example and make a couple sim simple changes. At the very least, start with running the example. And also, so you should al already answer yes if you've managed to run the example from beginning to end without any problem. And if you've managed to, you know, if you understand what's happening. Now, as I said, uh, you can change this function you can change the prior, you can change the relative uncertainty. Um, if you haven't had the chance to do any of these and you like to, just answer no. And um, I'll give you a little more time. So we currently have 40 yeses and three noes, and we topped out at something like 57 responses. So there's a couple of people who are responding who haven't yet responded. All right, so how's this lag actually? Uh, do we get a lot of questions? There were a couple as you were going through and it looks like they've been responding been answered maybe uh stefan yeah most of them are being worked on okay all right so unless let's see okay I'll, let's wait another minute and then i'll move on to the next exercise because it's actually quite similar the next exercise so even if you haven't managed to run the first one uh, but you could still be trying the second one and JF, one question. Yes. So so we have one person on Slack who varied J X max to fifty. 
and doesn't get a good posterior. Let's see, we can try it right away. So, so um, most likely what's happening is um, it's just numerical. So let's see. Um, Okay, so let me kind of return to, or actually let me run it on a binder. So is this gonna work? Yeah. So if I just put 50 here. Okay, binder is not working. Um, it's just, okay, give me a second. I'll just, just hide the, the likelihood. All right. Right, so what's most likely happening here is a failure of the, of the interpolator. So one of the parameters that I actually didn't say you could, uh, that I actually didn't highlight is, so here I'm using only 10 samples of the parameter space to actually obtain uh, an emulator. So this would be like, you only have 10 calculations that you can use to train your emulator. Now, if you have a very wide parameter space, this might not be enough. So although this is kind of a, I mean, it's not a linear model, so actually this, this matters. So hopefully this will work. Yeah, so this was a failure of the emulator. And this is actually a very good example of um, somewhere where Bayesian, where a Gaussian process emulator would have performed much better than the simple emulator I'm using here. Because the simple emulator I'm using here is not accounting for interpolation uncertainty while the Gaussian process emulator would have. So it would have, essentially would not have recovered the parameter better necessarily, but it would have had a much wider uncertainty. While the emulator here is unreasonably certain that it can describe well the model, but it doesn't balloon up like I showed in, in, um, in the slides. It doesn't balloon up when, um, let's see, when you're away from the design points. So let me just open this again. So this is what you want your emulator to do in general. And this is what Gaussian process emulator do in general. So if you don't have enough point, the uncertainty will balloon up. My emulator doesn't do this here. I'm using a very simple emulator. So that's, that's what happened. All right. Does this answer the question? I think so, yes. And we're at 45 yeses and zero noes. All right, let's move on. So, Let's open the next exercise, exercise one, which is again, very simple. And you've, you've actually seen example one in uh, the slides that I showed. So what you can do is just run them one by one or, um, right. So again, you have a different observable, which is the main difference here. You, I just changed the observable here. So you could do the same with the previous, uh, with actually the previous slide, the previous uh, exercise notebook. You could just change this value here. And you define, again, some prior range, some truth, because again, this is a closure test. And you can plot what the function looks like. And this time you can see there's trouble on the way, right? Because your observable doesn't map to a single parameter. Now, I won't say this is common in heavy end collision, actually. This is, this is actually relatively uncommon. But what can happen is that you have, um, you can have poor constraint on your parameter. So um, essentially there's not a big difference between multi being multi-valued or just having an uncertainty so large that 
you can't really tell if you're here or if you're here. So for example, let me, let me show what the true value is and what the error band is. So remember that I put the errors here and just, I just put by hand. And it defines an error bar here. So now the true value is here, but the Bayesian parameter estimation should also find this one. Because really from the data, there's no way, you lost the information that you have. Uh, once you have the data, you cannot tell if you're here or if you're here. So again, you do the same thing. You can use more, so I use somewhat more uh, design points here. Again, the number of samples that you should use, the number of parameter samples that you should use should depend on how smooth your parameter depend your model dependence on the parameter is. So here it's less smooth than before. So you presumably need more points. So again, simple interpolator, prior, posterior defined, and then you you get your um, you get your posterior. So true value is here, and your posterior is indeed peaked around it but it cannot tell, it lost information. It cannot tell if, if this value is not favored by data because really the observable is the same there. Now, notice that there, the width is quite different actually. And again, remember the width is different because if I move up again and look at the function. So if you have a weak dependence on your parameter your an uncertainty on your experimental data will translate into a much larger uncertainty on your parameter. While if you have a stronger dependence on your parameter, the uncertainty will be, will translate into something smaller on X, right? Now this means that if you just increase somewhat your uncertainty, so let's say you have 20% uncertainty on your data here. It will become really difficult to constrain anything because now you here you have a weak dependence on your on your parameter, so you have um, so it's very difficult here to constrain the the value of x. Even if you use this value and some uncertainty around here, it's just twenty percent. And if you repeat everything with this, Now you obtain very broad, a very broad posterior. And again, this one's always broader than this one because the model depends uh, more weakly on the parameter in this region of parameter than it does in this region. And again, so here your posterior is cut off, which is again, probably not good. Now, let me highlight that if your posterior is cut off like this, so, so typically, as I said, it means that your prior is actually too narrow, most likely. So you, you set the minimum with zero, but actually um, it's cut off. So somehow your model seems to favor a value that's, that's below zero. Now, let's say you know that X has to be positive. Then the problem is not that you should allow X to be negative, but perhaps you have to reparameterize this on the log plot. So it's possible that here it looks like zero is favored, but maybe you know, point 0.1 is favored, but maybe point 0.001 would not be favored. So maybe you would want to reparameterize your, um, your parameter here so that it's, it's a log instead of just X. So that's one way that sometime you have to um, transform your parameter to really have meaningful, meaningful posterior and meaningful priors. So again, this was a pretty simple example. You can again play with the, um, the, the uncertainty that you have, change the uncertainty. Uh, you can change um, the, the, the function here, the value of the truth and um, if you use something that's large enough, you don't have a degeneracy anymore. So Jean-Francois, I'm gonna read off a comment. Um, 
I think the pace of the hands-on is a bit too fast. It's hard to follow the shared screen, our notebooks, and pay some attention to what is done in the notebooks and the commentary and the changes at the same time. That's, so maybe you could take a step back for a minute. That's more than fair, yes. So, um, I mean, okay, let me give people a few minutes to actually uh, look at the notebook, actually, and try to run it. Just click yes once you're, okay, let's start with just clicking yes if you've managed to run exercise one from beginning to end. We're seeing the yeses tick up. We're at 34 yeses and zero noes, but I think that people just haven't had a chance to respond yet. Sure. And after people get a little bit of a breather to catch up, I was gonna ask, uh, ask Stefan and Uli, if there are any questions from the Slack worth highlighting, the Slack or the Zoom. So there's nothing on the Zoom. Good, there should not be. All right. We're good on the Slack. Okay, and we have 41 yeses. So maybe proceed, but be a little mindful not to get going too fast. That's, yeah, very good. Um, all right, let's move on to the next exercise. Well, maybe the people who are still struggling and haven't received, haven't gotten an, an answer should click no for the time and then change it later, just so that we see who is still in the active pipeline. Yes. I don't see any no's, so I think you are safe to go slowly ahead. Okay. All right, so load exercise two. So for some reason, so I started at zero because the zero with exercise was very, uh, was kind of trivial. Um, I understand it makes, uh, it makes accounting a little awkward. So exercise two is the third one that we're doing. So click on exercise two and open it again. And actually, while people are doing this, can I just probe uh, how many people are using Binder as opposed to using it um, on their local workstation? So if you're using Binder, could you, uh, could you click yes? The yeses shot up. There's 32 yeses and rising and two no's. Four no's. With, okay. with okay. not every, people r responding rapidly. So let's. 10 no's, 12 no's. So right now it is 42 to 15. Okay, so most people are using Binder, which I think is good news because it means that it's running well for most people, I assume and that people didn't have to worry about uh, install, installing anything. Um, so let's use this as useful wisdom for future schools. Now for this next exercise, so the first two exercises that we did, they had one parameter and one output. Now again, complexity can come from different size of a Bayesian analysis. You can have few outputs and many parameters. You can have few parameters, many outputs, or you can have generally many output, many parameters. So what I'll be doing is slowly increase the number of observable and of parameters. So what I do here, I still have a single observable, but this time I have two parameters. And as you can expect, this will be a 
poorly constrained problem because you have less constraints than you have um, than you have observables. I'm sorry, you have less constraints than you have parameters. So the observable this time is defined here. Again, it's a simple, so an example later, we'll see an example that's closer to what we used in heavy end collision. So all the parameters and all the uh, observable will make more sense then. But for now, let's just think of this as general closure, um, closure tests with generic observable, generic parameters. Now, this is the, this is the function, this is the observable and the parameters are X and Y. So this time you need to define a range for both parameters, a prior for both parameters, a prior for X, a prior for Y. So run the first one, libraries, run this one. Now this time you'll have Again, since we're doing a closure test, you have you know the true value of the parameters for which uh, you do a closure test. So these are the truth here. And you can pick, here I picked twice the same value, but you can pick different values. And just make sure that your values are within your uh, prior. If they're not, if they're too much at the edge of a prior, it's gonna be an issue as well. And we use these truth to just define the value of your observable. And you also define some uncertainty and you get your, um, here I just use some relative uncertainty and you get some absolute uncertainty uh, depending on the value of the mean. And again, it's a value you can change if you want. We'll run this. Now this time, remember, we have two parameters, a single observable. So what we can do is plot what the observable looks like. So actually I'll comment out this and this. So what is being done here, so you just sample your parameter space and we will plot what the observable look like across this parameter space. And typically you want to do this with your model. You want to know how your observable change as you go across the parameter space. And this connects to something I said at the end in my summary, which is you have to make sure you understand that your model depends on the parameters sufficiently that you can constrain the parameters, that your model is well behaved across the parameter space. And so this is one way of doing it. You simply plot in 1D or in 2D how your observable depends on your parameter. So you can run this one and you get something like this. So if your parameter X, parameter Y, you have different contours and this is the value of the observable you know, at different points of the parameter space. So here's around 30, here's around zero. And if you want, you can, so this was already commented out. So perhaps you already had um, a white band here. So this white band is essentially all the values of the data that are consistent with the model parameters. Right. So if that's confusing, you can just remove it. So let me wait a minute just to make sure everybody's at this point. Should we do a yes, no poll to, so people say yes when they're caught up? Yeah, let's, let's do a yes, no poll. We are at 44 to one. So for that one, um, 
a 46 to one if you can ask something in the slack if you're stuck that'll help us get you back on track and we're at 48 to one so i'm going to say for the one please seek help on, on slack and then i think we can proceed for everybody else yes So again, this part of a code is to do the equivalent of what you would um, is essentially getting your calculation for a set of parameter points. So again, it's the equivalent of, of uh, getting a calculation at these points or perhaps more accurately these points because you have some uncertainty. Now again, I'm not using a Gaussian process simulator. I'm using a linear interpolator. So it's somewhat so it looks somewhat closer to this than to, to this because I don't have interpolation on certain key. And again, you would simply, for your own application, you could simply load your calculation for different value of the parameter instead of, instead of doing this. And then you can just uh, make so here we have a 2D interpolator. And here I just make sure that the interpolator is working. And I can do this by picking a random point in the parameter space. All right, so X. So here I wrote it this way so that I can make sure that my parameter point is in the prior range. And then I just evaluate my what my observable is at this point. And then I evaluate my what my emulator predicts at this point. So the model is actually um, bilinear. So um, I think the interpolation is exact in this case. All right. Now, this time, what changes that your prior, of course, now depends on two parameters. And um, here I'm still using a trivial uniform prior um, that is cut off by the uh, parameter range. But this is where, for example, you could have correlated priors or anything. Um, you, could, you can have an arbitrary uh, complicated prior. And now your likelihood is still a very simple function, but it depends on two parameters this time. And your posterior is simply your prior times the likelihood. But again, they both depend on the parameters. Now, of course, the likelihood depends on the data as well. It's just the way I wrote the script, the data is passed. The data is kind of a global variable, so I'm not passing it directly. So I'll have a, an example later where this is done more systematically, where I can really, I really pass the parameters and the data so that one can really see visually um, that you know, prior only depends on the parameter and the likelihood depends on the parameter and the data. So let me stop here for a second, just to make sure everybody followed up to this point. JF, what does it yes. take to vectorize the emulators? It's, it's just a technicality actually to, um, in Python essentially, sometimes you want, to, you want to apply a function on a vector. So you want to apply a function on every element of a vector. It's very efficient to do this and some functions do it naturally, but others will only take scalars as input. So if you vectorize, actually, you just make your, you essentially just make your emulator, um, it, it allows your emulator to actually take vectors as input instead of scalar. So here, X and Y um, are, okay, they're actually scalars. Let's see, why do I need to do this? Let's 
Now oh, let's try. Oh no, they're actually not. I actually pass. So if you if you look here, I I I actually pass arrays uh, for x and y. So I'm I'm trying to calculate the posterior on every single on 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 vectors essentially. So instead of looping over all the elements, I just pass vectors. And that's why I it, essentially it's a very efficient way of evaluating the likelihood. So perhaps we can have people click the yes if they're caught up at this point and know if they're struggling or need more time. And to give you a sense of time, so it's 1120, so we nominally have about 40 minutes left. That sounds good. We are so far at 33 yeses. All right, we're at 42 yeses and a bunch of non-responses. Okay, all right. So I tend to say let's, and the yeses ticked up as soon as I said that. So okay. I'd say proceed. All right, sounds good. So then we still want to simply plot for posterior. So this time it's going to be just like if we look, if you look here. It's going to be a 2D distribution, right? Um, because you have two parameters and you're plotting your posterior as a function of these two parameters. So um, you just need to run this here. Okay, I forgot to run this one actually. Did I mess up the, oh, I think I forgot to run a few ones. Let's see. Yeah, actually, I, oh, okay. I know what happened. Right. So this is what the posterior looks like. as a function of X and Y. And obviously, if you go back to, um, so you have, this is the result of plot the posterior here. If you go back, to when you plot that the observable itself. Of course, if you add the data on top of the observable, it looks very much the same, right? Of course. So basically, these values of data are the ones that are consistent. So this is basically the value of the data if you plot it as a on on top of the model as a function of the parameter. So of course you expect your you expect this to be essentially your posterior, except if you had a uh, an unusual prior, right? So if you had anything else than constant for prior, you would obtain something different because we're using a trivial prior. Our posterior is essentially this. So this is our so prior, and here I'm plotting in red, basically the, the the range of the data, right? So the plus or minus sigma around the mean of the data. Now, one thing we can do once you have this is remember if I go in the lecture, 
So one thing you can do is project. You can do um, marginal, you can look at the ma marginal posterior. So you can take you can take one of the parameter, integrate over it, and obtain a 1D distribution. And same for the other one. Right? So you can obtain from this example, you can obtain two 1D posterior that are marginals. So this is what this second part of the code does. It looks at the marginals. And what happens here is that you simply integrate over posterior over one of the variable, over one of the parameter, and you just plot the result. So let me run this. It's going to take a minute, maybe not a minute, but a few seconds, um, because just simply numerical integration. And you can see that the result is somewhat odd, actually. So, so for why you get a good posterior, well, a decent posterior peaked around the true value, but for x you get a somewhat odd posterior edge. And there's a few things to remember, actually. So, so here, one of the issue is a good old plotting issue, which is that this is not zero. This is 0 0.75. This is, you know, 2.5. So, you know, this factor of three, roughly, between the two. So this is actually relatively, this is not a very, uh, you know, you know, here, you have infinitely less chance that your parameter is favored by data than here, right? But here you have maybe a factor of, you know, you have a factor of two between the two. So it's not very much. So first, you know, remember when you make a plot, just remember where the, where the axis is. The second thing is it's simply a, a problem. Okay, maybe I can leave this here for a second. So, so that information sinks in. So, Depending on how you how we make that plot, this looks this is not as a significant uh, posterior as it looks like. I mean, this this is far from zero. Uh, this is somewhat more likely, but not that much more likely. Right. So the other problem that's happening here is that our posterior is not bound. So we have an under constrained problem. We have two parameters as a single observable, which means that your posterior is actually not bound in the parameter range. So it doesn't drop to zero, you know, at, at the edge, which means that if you marginalize, you get, you will, you, you may get um, unreliable results. So if you go back to the, to here, what's simply happening is that, of course, if you integrate in this direction, I mean, there's no chance that you're parameters are here, right, in Y. So you know that it's somewhere in here. But in X, you you don't have, um, is that correct? So Y, so when Y you have good constraint, but in X, you know, it, it could be here, it could be here, it could be, and because of, because it never dropped, so the distribution is actually completely degenerate in X, you don't get you don't get any good constraints actually. So the so the marginal in this case is not very um, enlightening, and this happens. I mean, this is somewhat of an extreme example. This happens in real life when you have posterior, you have parameters that are not well defined, and they might lead to to one dimensional marginals that are not especially insightful. So let me, let's poll again to see if people actually uh, manage to run all of this, if this makes sense, if they have any questions. All right, the yeses are ticking up. All right. Maybe while you um, 
while we wait for the yeses to tick up, there's a question. Could you elaborate more on the emulator? So, okay, that's a broad question. So let me repeat a few things and maybe um, um, the question can be clarified if that doesn't answer it. So, unless your model is extremely, extremely fast, you will never perform a Bayesian parameter estimation directly from your model. We'll always use an emulator. Now, the standard emulator is a Gaussian process emulator that will take these points, that will take samples of the parameter space, will take the uncertainty on these samples, and will build a probabilistic emulator that will mimic observables. Now, I'm using a much simpler emulator that's basically uh, assuming that you don't really have any significant uh, you don't have very complicated model and you don't have any significant uncertainties. My emulator right now is just um, linear, uh, linear interpolator between each one of the points with some uncertainty band around it. Um, again, there'll be observables, there'll be exercise tomorrow and later today with Gaussian process emulator. Um, the reason, so there are there, there's an infinite number of benefits to using uh, Gaussian process simulator in terms of the quality of the emulation. Um, the downside is that it's somewhat, you have, you, it introduces uh, some level of complexity. That means that the, uh, the codes become more uh, complicated and they can be, can be a little intimidating at first. Um, so I think in terms of understanding what we have. So the, the example I'm showing now would be essentially the same if we had a Gaussian process simulator because I'm looking at simple examples. Now, if you want to compare with data, unless, unless, you're, mal, unless you're doing something kind of per new study, you probably don't want to use uh, that simple of an emulator. You probably want to use a Gaussian process simulator. Um, I will invite you to look at this uh, these slides by Jake and Wei Yao from previously year about the Gaussian process simulator. It's extremely thorough. There's a ton of information and they have exercises as well. Can I ask a question? Yes. I always thought that the, the absolutely decisive argument in, in terms in favor of Gaussian process emulators is that it quantifies the interpretation error. Yes. What, are, what other emulators are there that have that same property? I'm not aware of anyone, any, any other ones actually. Um, and my understanding actually from talking with uh, people in the status quo community is that if you're only interested in modeling the mean uh, extremely well, Gaussian process simulators are not necessarily the ones that perform the best. But if you're interested in modeling the mean and the uncertainty, apparently there's not a lot of competition. Um, I invite my, uh, invite my colleagues to correct me if I'm wrong or to add anything about this. But I believe that in terms of um, modeling the uncertainty, which is essential, that's what we're doing here. We're propagating uncertainties from model and, from model and data onto parameters. That's what we're doing. We need to model these properly. Yes. So we had an ongoing poll and we're at 44 yeses and no no's. All right, let's move on. All right, so this is the last warm up before I think the nice, um, the nice final exercise. Um, this time we have two observable, two, um, two parameters. So you can introduce more, most of the model complexity, most of the complexity of Bayesian parameter estimation here. So the two observables are given here. Again, they're functions that I chose uh, with some range. You again run, uh, this time you have, you'll have two data, set, two data sets, two uh, sets of uncertainties, and you can vary the uncertainties independently. You have some values for two parameters. So again, this is a 
this is a closure test. And you can again plot what the data looks like as what the what the model looks like as a function of the parameters. And so this is simply a function it, that loops over the two observable and make a plot of the observable, the value of the observable as a function of the two parameters. Uh, so this observable one, observable two, both depend on both parameters. And if you uncomment this line and this line, you will show you know, bands where that correspond to the value of the data if you overlay them on the, um, this, this, that, this map of the observable as a function of the parameters. So in one case, one of the other point is consistent with this range of parameter. The other case, it's consistent with this range of parameter. Let me pause for a second here. Let's poll actually, just make sure everybody moved on to exercise three and made it up to this point. Okay, I just cleared the poll, so please answer again. How is the poll looking? 44 to one. So most people are caught up. I don't see others. Uh, the, there are some questions, um, but they look like they're not on the exercises per se. Let me ask Stefan, to give an evaluation if we if there's a question worth asking. There is only one answer, one unanswered question on Slack, and I think the TAs will will be able to to get that. Okay. Okay, so then please proceed. All right. So again, in this case, if you had calculation, you would be loading a set of calculation that sample both parameters, and you would be training an emulator on on this calculation. So that's what I'm doing here. And again, you can check that your uh, emulator is working well by just comparing the value of the emulator with the value of the observe at some test point here. And you can pick whatever test point you want. And in general, the emulator should do relatively well. Now, this time, the, again, the prior depends on two parameters. The likelihood depends on two parameters, but this time the likelihood is more uh, complicated because you have to sum over uh, the different observables in the likelihood. So um, you have this sum over the observables and um, you have, uh, you, know, you get your value of your model from the emulator, the uncertainty of your model from the emulator the data, the uncertainty on the data, and then you compute your likelihood. And then you posterior simply the prior times the likelihood. Now what you'll want to do again is plot the posterior. And the posterior will still be, the, you, you still have two parameters. 
So it doesn't matter how many observable you have. It's a 2D, your posterior is 2D. It's given by the dimensionality of the parameter space. So this time you'll be plotting your posterior, again, as a function of X and Y. And you'll be comparing with the true value. So you can run this. And you get this. Do you have a posterior here? And the true value is this, this red point. And you have some band because you have some uncertainty that you specified earlier on your, on your data. Now let me poll to see if people have made it up to this point and if everything makes sense up to this point. We are at 27 yeses, zero noes, and not responded wins by a large margin. Okay, and let's, I'll wait a tiny bit. People are probably uh, just running and um, trying different things. So again, this is 2D, 2D posterior. And again, just like in the previous example, and just like I discussed in the slides, you often want to marginalize. Now this time, so, you know, you have this distribution in 2D, and you want to marginalize in 1D, and just integrate over one of the parameter. Now this time, posterior is, relatively well con contained into the, the prior range. So you expect meaningful uh, marginal posterior in 1D. So if you go to the next section, you can run the code. And again, you're simply integrating the posterior along one of the parameter and you're plotting it as a function of the other parameter. So we're at 41 yeses and zero noes. I, I think okay. we can proceed. All right. Sounds good. So it's going to take a minute or two for the posterior to, uh, for the marginal posterior to be calculated. It's simply um, the way the, the, code is, the, the code is written. It's not particularly fast uh, to integrate in 1D. And you get a posterior for the parameters that are well peaked around the real value, around the true value. So here you really, you really get meaningful constraints on your, uh, on your parameters from the 1D posterior as well. So these, these are examples where it would make a lot of sense to summarize your constraint on Y as some, some mean plus or minus some, some variance. And here again, some mean plus or minus some variance. You do see that you cut off somewhat your posterior here. Um, so this could be a case where maybe you want to plot X on a log plot instead of plotting it on a linear plot. Maybe you want to probe small values of X. Or maybe X in your case can be negative, in which case you would actually use, you would actually probe negative values. So I suggest we move to the next exercise, which I think is much more interesting. It will summarize everything we've just seen. 
So let me open the other exercise and we'll just poll to see if everyone is ready to start exercise four. Sorry, did, did you say you wanted to do a poll or? Yeah, let's do a poll. Just okay. uh, one last one to see if everybody's ready to go to exercise four. The yeses are slowly ticking up, but uh, so we're at 40 and we've gotten up to about 55 responses, but we're also losing some people as it gets later in the day. Okay. Okay, so if there's still zero, is there still zero? Yeah, yeah we're at 44 to zero. Okay, I think we can move on. Um, and anyhow, I think every exercise builds on the previous one. So you can just move to exercise four and it's gonna, it's gonna summarize everything we've discussed up to now. So exercise four is essentially the same as the previous one, but with something that could be, that is much closer to maybe a language that you're used to. So, so let's say we have two observables. We have the charge hadron multiplicity that depends on two parameters. It depends on how much energy you put in your system that we're gonna call the normalization of your initial conditions and it depends on some effective uh, shear viscosity uh, at over S, specific shear viscosity. Now your charge hadron multiplicity depends Roughly linearly on the norm. If you look at if you if you look at hydrodynamic simulations, and you you actually look at the correlation between the charge hydrodynamic multiplicity and how much energy you put in, it's relatively linear. And you also have some dependence on your viscosity because your viscosity is dissipative; it produces entropy. So the higher your viscosity, the typically you end up with a higher multiplicity as well. So this is actually a realistic dependence. This is a realistic of model dependence of your charge hydrogen multiplicity, on the normalization of your initial condition and then your uh, shear viscosity. Now suppose you have a second um, observable. You have the charge hydrogen V2 that this time depends mostly on the viscosity actually, mostly on your shear viscosity. So the larger your viscosity, the smaller your charge hydron beat. So we're assuming here we have a single centrality for simplicity. So you look, for example, at these, these this charge hydron multiplicity and just charge hydron V2 and 0.5% centrality at the LHC. So you have some dependence on your shear viscosity and you have some smaller dependence on your, on your total energy of your, of your charge hydron V2. And again, these are relatively um, realistic dependence that you would have within a hydrodynamic model. Now you have two parameters. Again, you have this normalization of the energy deposition. There's some range you want to probe. You have the shear viscosity, effective shear viscosity. You have some range you want to probe. And since again, we're doing a closure test, there's some true value that you, that you want to study. So you'll, you'll do your closure test around this true value. So later, if you want, you can change the, this true value and you can change this, um, these, this prior range if you want. Although these prior range are uh, somewhat realistic. Now you have two observable and you have, you have two parameters which are here. All the parameters are here. And you have two observables. You have your charge hydrogen multiplicity and you have your V2. And here you can put your um, experimental, your artificial experimental uncertainty here that you put on your data. Again, because we're doing a closure test. Now, if you wanted, you could just load data from 
You could just look up data online and put the value of your data here. But it wouldn't be a closer test anymore and you wouldn't know exactly what's the true value of the parameters. Now, okay, now the way this notebook was written is somewhat different from the rest. So all the input parameters are here and almost all the rest is just uh, Python code to, to uh, you know, go through the, the motion of um, getting the, the data from, uh, getting the, the data from the, for the closure test. So essentially you just evaluate your model at these two points. So maybe we can just run this one, this first one here, shouldn't be any problem. Then here, you don't need to understand the code. Um, if you want, you can just uh, comment out um, this, this print statement. So this data dictionary will just contain essentially your data. So for the multiplicity, you have a mean, you have an uncertainty. For the V2, you have a mean and an uncertainty. And the code just does it just loops over observable. So it's generalizable to an arbitrary number of observable. Now what we can do is again, look at what the model, what the observable dependence on the parameters are and what the data look like on this, uh, uh, on you know in the in the model in the parameter space, so you can run this this other script. So again, so this is the end charge the eta. So if you increase your normalization of the energy density, your your charge hydrogen multiplicity increases, and if you increase the effective viscosity, your charge hydrogen multiplicity increases as well. Although the dependence is weaker here, so you go from maybe you know. Uh, it's maybe a 10 to 20 percent effect, right? Now here for your V2, so if you increase your normalization of the energy density, you change your V2 a little bit, but mostly you're mainly um, suppressing your V2. So these are large values of V2, these are smaller. So you're suppressing your V2 by increasing your shear viscosity. All right. So can we just poll to see if everybody made it up to this point, if all of this makes sense? Okay, yeses are ticking up, but it's taking people a little bit to respond, of course. Okay. Forty-two yeses, zero noes. We've lost about 15 people since the beginning all right. and we have 11 minutes left all right sounds good. nominally yes i think we'll i think we'll make it in time all right so this is where you would for example load your calculation from disk if you had a uh, calculation from this here we have a simple model so we just actually generate on the fly the calculations and we build our emulator from it Again, a simple emulator. This time posterior is written in, in a more general way. So you have the posterior depends on the parameter and the data. The prior only depends on the parameters. And the likelihood depends on the parameter and the data. And um, your, your likelihood is still the same function. It's just written in a more general way, right? And your prior, I still assume a simple prior here. You can load this. And again, we can do the same thing. So this is essentially the same as a previous example, but with um, observables and parameter that makes more physical sense. So this time, again, it's a 2D, you have two parameters, it's a 2D posterior. You can just run it and you get this. So you get that this was the true value that you had for your closure test. And this is the result of your patient parameter estimation. So you have some uncertainty in the normalization. You have some uncertainty in your constraint of the effective viscosity. You have these uncertainties because you put some uncertainty on the data, right? On the fake data. 
Now again, you can do the same thing and just marginalize these posterior. And you can just run the last script and you will see that you're just projecting this in one dimension or the other. And don't worry about um, these meshes. It's basically just, if you're integrating regions where the posterior is very, very small, the, the algorithm is not sure if it's just not converging or if it's just integrating zero, essentially. Um, so you'll have to wait a few seconds and then you'll get the results for the, mar the one demarginalized posterior. Is this a good place for a poll again, for them to click yes? Yeah, let's poll. We're waiting anyway. It's taking longer than I remember. So the question is if they are caught up. Essentially, yes. The yeses are ticking. There is one no and 31 yeses. Okay. All right. So for those who are done, I invite you to, to so go back to the beginning of the file. And you probably don't want to change anything here. But what you want, what you may want to do is you can change the truth, for example. Or you may want to change your, your uncertainty and you want to see how this affects the final posterior. So here, there was only 5% uncertainty on the data, which is not big. And you can even put the, so here I have some uncertainty on the emulator, but let's assume you're, you're, you have a very dense design. So you have, and you have very small statistical uncertainty on your calculation. So you can just zero out your statistical uncertainty here and see what the result looks like. So you can rerun the whole thing. And you'll see the marginal will still take a few minutes to solve, but you, you can see that you still have a significant uncertainty on your normalization and on your effective viscosity. Even if you have essentially no theoretical uncertainty and you have only 5% uncertainty on your data. And that will be relatively typical. It's rare that, what we're, that our model have a very, very strong dependence on the parameters. Often we have relatively weak dependence and this lead to you know, a small uncertainty on your um, small uncertainty on your um, on your data will lead to significant uncertainty on your parameters and you can see that the uncertainty is not um, is not symmetric so because we have so let's see it's still calculating so you can see how much it, how much the result change if you reduce your uncertainty to one percent for example If you want to speed up, you can probably speed up the... We have 40 yeses and zero noes. All right, okay. All right, so if you want, you can change this uncertainty again. So just put 1% here, rerun the whole thing, and you'll see that at this point, you should obtain a much stronger constraint on your on your viscosities. And so your posterior becomes very, yeah, so your posterior becomes very, very narrow. And again, you'll get very sharply peaked distribution here. 
Yeah, so you get sharply peak and quite sharply peak as well. Um, and it doesn't look Gaussian just because I, I lowered the number of, of sample points here that I plot. Now, let me use a few last few minutes to, um, to show what we should do as what I suggest is a good, let's see, a good assignment until tomorrow. So let me just post this in the Slack channel and I'll share the screen briefly and look at it with you. So Derek Everett has this example that has one parameter, one observable, but this time with a Gaussian process simulator. So you can get, again, a simple example, but gain some intuition about how using a Gaussian process simulator will affect your Bayesian parameter estimation. So again, you can either use the GitHub or the binder version. So let me open the binder version. While this loads, let me remind people that for tomorrow's interactive session, you're going to need to um, upload your, uh, your Git repository for the summer school as a whole and read the README for the um, soft Bayesian analysis and follow those instructions there. Yes. Okay, it's taking a little longer than I remembered. Um, let's see, while this is loading, let me actually just open the, okay, all right, so this loaded. So again, you should be able to use this one on Binder again. So if you don't want to download it on your computer. So there's a lot of explanation that will just um, that should um, summarize a lot and complement a lot what I discussed about today. And the point of this example is constraining the shear viscosity using a V2 as observable. So again, it's only one power to one observable, but it, this time it uses a Gaussian process emulator. And uh, you will see, for example, if your calculation looks something like this, you would not want to use something like a linear interpolator, which would do a terrible job. You would want to use something closer to uh, something like Gaussian process simulator that will try to smooth out and include this uncertainty. And um, you will see how to, um, how to look at different priors and the effect that these different priors will have New Bayesian parameter estimation. And let me not show the, the sell the punch. But um, I recommend that if you have time uh, until tomorrow, you can look at this example, go through it, uh, gain some intuition from it. It's a good summary and it's actually much more than what I've explained today. And tomorrow, Wei Yao will take over will again show a short presentation of Trento and then we'll um, show additional hands-on, we'll have additional hands-on session on Bayesian parameter estimation between Trento and um, actually some, some experimental data, but also closure tests. 
So I think we can end here. Um, let's, maybe I can take a minute if there's any more questions, uh, people can ask on Slack. And if there's no more question, we'll just uh, call it a day uh, now. All right, so let me kick it to Stefan and see if there are, um, if there are questions from the Slack to be answered. We're caught up. Okay. Very good. Then, especially because it's getting late in Asia, let's wrap up the session. Last call for any closing remarks from any of the organizers, TAs, chairs. Let me just thank all the TAs that helped. Uh, Derek way out Dan and everybody else that anybody else that helped uh, thank the, the chairs and if there's any more questions of course you can just ask on the Bayesian uh, on the channel that we use for today and tomorrow we'll have a chance to ask questions as well uh, during way hours uh, session so I think that's all from on my side um, yeah all right then we will close the session. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow at 9 in the morning or whatever time it is in your time zone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Stefan? Stefan?